You got your Nintendo and my Atari. That's right, the fun is back on NES Works Guide In. You're a bum, aren't you? No, I am not a bum. When I'm not going for high scores in the arcades, I'm home playing games on my Atari 7800. As an expert, I like the 7800 because there are great arcade hits like Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong Jr. So here's a historical oddity, a well-known Nintendo game that shipped for a competing console long after the NES's debut. I can only imagine what Hiroshi Yamauchi had to say about this. You'd be hard-pressed to name a company as protective of its game properties as Nintendo. Maybe Square Enix, I suppose? But even then, it's a tough call, and I'd still give the edge to Nintendo. Seems like every other week a story pops up on the newsfeed about Nintendo issuing a cease and desist order for some fan project, or shutting down a gray market merchant who got a little too frisky with intellectual property rights. And one thing you almost never see is a Nintendo game on someone else's system. Once the Famicom and NES hit it big, Nintendo basically went into lockdown with its software. I can only think of a handful of instances where a Nintendo game showed up on a non-Nintendo platform post-NES. Those misbegotten CDI games that really only existed despite Sony, perhaps, and a few retro reissues for Sharp's Pocket Zarus that probably only came about as a result of a dusty old agreement between Sharp and Nintendo for rights to the name Family Computer. That's about it, though, except for these games a trio of Nintendo classics that appeared on Atari 7800. According to research conducted by Atari Archive creator Kevin Bunch, they shipped in late 1988, well after the NES had established a foothold and Nintendo had put all of its eggs into that particular basket. It's a strange situation, and I've been unable to find any hard information about how this came to pass online. Here's the best guess I can stitch together, though. Before the big American console crash of 1983 and 84, Atari locked down exclusive home console and computer licenses for every valuable arcade property it could get its hands on. In the case of Nintendo's games, Atari secured computer rights to Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. and console rights to Mario Brothers. The console rights to the Kong games landed with Coleco, although things became tempestuous in the litigation sense of the word, once Coleco decided to publish a separate enhanced version of the Kong games for the Atom home computer. This was around the time the console market imploded, so things get murky here. Hidden within that murk is the fact that Nintendo and Atari briefly explored the possibility of Atari distributing the Famicom in the West for Nintendo, resulting in HAL's trio of arcade ports to NES as a side effect of those talks. That deal eventually went awry, due largely to Atari's misfortunes and the fact that the company was sold for parts to different investors, splitting Atari into an Atari home games business, Atari Inc., and a standalone arcade division, Atari Games. And of course, when Atari splintered, its plans to launch the 7800 in 1984 fell apart. The console wouldn't show up for another two years, and its library wouldn't start to shift to all new games rather than warehoused holdovers intended for the 1984 launch until 1988. So here we are in the back half of 1988, and we have a trio of games that almost certainly happened only due to the relationship between Atari and Nintendo that dates back to the days before Nintendo had decided to self-distribute the Famicom and the West under its own steam. Did Donkey Kong and its companion releases for 7800 happen because of some tit-for-tat agreement resulting from the Atari Famicom talks, similar to the way Philips was allowed to create Hotel Mario and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon as a perk for helping Nintendo to wriggle out of their Sony talks? Or were these simply Atari soft holdovers from the intended 1984 launch of the 7800? I do not actually know. I speculate that it's probably a little of column A and a little of column B. This trio appears to have been developed newly for a 1988 release rather than consisting of code that had been shelved since 1984. The developer responsible for these ports, and the Game Developer Research Institute cites a Santa Clarita-based company called International Technology Development Corporation, only has a handful of other games credited to their name, all hailing from 1987. The chances of ITDC creating a bunch of 7800 games in 1984 and then laying silent until they put together a couple of Atari ST games in 87 strike me as extraordinarily thin. So, most likely, Atari Inc. discovered it retained some sort of licensing claim on these three titles and decided, what the heck, let's publish them. Nintendo titles had made a lot of money for Atari in the olden days after all, and these releases landed right around the time that Atari subsidiary Tengen was looking to circumvent Nintendo's NES licensing requirements. 
what better way to stick it to the competition than by flaunting new versions of the games on which Nintendo had built its entire video game empire? Well, whatever the case, these 7800 titles do give us the strange sight of core Nintendo franchises showing up on a rival console to the NES right as Nintendo began to assume control over the universe. But it's ultimately immaterial. Although these amount to perfectly respectable ports of three classic arcade games, they'd already been available for NES with nicer graphics and better audio quality for two years by the time they showed up on 7800. Nintendo reissued a combination pack of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. called Donkey Kong Classics at around the same time those two games showed up separately on 7800. And more damningly, the Mario franchise was just about to explode into a new form with a heavy focus on characters and inventive world design that would simultaneously tighten Nintendo's grip on the American market even as it defined how Americans perceived the Mario franchise. Sure, Mario Brothers is neat, but its single-screen score attack design was no match for the sprawling world diverse playable characters and score-free quest design, Super Mario Bros. 2. Heck, this version of Donkey Kong doesn't even rectify the NES game's greatest shortcoming by incorporating the Cement Factory or introductory cutscenes, continuing the sad trend of console enthusiasts hoping for a complete port of a seven-year-old arcade game being left in the cold. Still, taken on their own merits, these ports hold up fairly well. Although the 7800's low visual resolution results in rougher looking graphics than seen in the NES versions of the games, they play okay. The controls feel respectably responsive most of the time, and what stages made their way into the cartridges retain all their details. The first stage of Donkey Kong hasn't had the top tier of girders shaved away, for example. The low resolution does hurt Donkey Kong Jr. the most, exacerbating that game's already spotty collision detection and turning the second level in particular into a nightmare. And somehow, the physics in Mario Bros. turned out to be an absolute mess. Mario behaves weirdly, and the platform hit zone to determine which direction enemies upend when struck from below feels totally off. And let's not even talk about the audio quality, which is, you know, Atari 2600-like. ITDC did a fair job with these releases, but I'm not sure that they needed to exist. Certainly they don't compare well to Nintendo's own efforts with these same games. I know there were some people who refused to buy a Japanese-made console in the 1980s out of resentment for what they saw as a foreign power muscling and to push American businesses out of a market it had created, but those consumers were largely people who already owned an Atari 2600 or one of its contemporaries and thus had no end of options for playing these three games already. But hey, enjoy the sight of Nintendo games on a non-Nintendo console. The last time you'd see such an outlandish thing for quite a while. And speaking of holdovers from 1984, we end this episode with a little errata. Somehow, I completely skipped over one of the 7800's launch titles in previous episodes. Centipede. You know Centipede. You love Centipede. It's better than its sequel, Millipede. Designed by Donna Bailey, making it perhaps the first major hit video game to be directed by a woman, Centipede has been an arcade staple since its 1980 debut. Even today, any retro arcade worth its salt will absolutely have a Centipede unit that it keeps in proper repair on offer. Before Ms. Pac-Man came along, Centipede became famous for its purported ability to appeal to both men and women in a way you rarely saw in vintage arcades. Fundamentally, it's a riff on Space Invaders, a game about shooting things while trying not to be destroyed. And yet, its presentation sets it apart from its contemporaries. In an era where arcade games were still figuring out this whole color graphics thing, Centipede employed a pastel and neon color scheme rather than revolving around bold primaries. Rather than blazing reds and yellows, Centipede's visual palette emphasized vivid pinks, teals, soft greens, oranges and lavenders, and sky blues. And rather than taking place in the depths of space, it was set in a more down-to-earth setting, a garden. Players control... Well, I'm not really sure what the player avatar is supposed to represent, although I'm pretty sure it's not the magical gnome you see in some illustrations. Also, instead of controlling with your standard joystick, Centipede made use of a trackball that allowed for fast, intuitive, precise, analog control. As you can imagine, commentary about Centipede's popularity among women relies on an awful lot of Freudian eyebrow wagging and gender essentialism, but putting all of that aside, it really did appeal to a much wider audience than many other games at the time. Certainly it's the only video game my own mother has ever enjoyed, although I suspect she was drawn to it more by its cool Art Nouveau side decal than by her vague enthusiasm for gardening. Centipede changes the invader's formula by turning the alien fleet into a single serpentine anthropod, consisting of 10 segments which you destroy by shooting upward into the screen. When you land a shot against the centipede, the segment you hit disintegrates, and the segment directly behind that point becomes a new head, 
The more body segments you destroy, the more tiny, independently mobile centipedes come after you. Moving in erratic patterns around the screen and reversing direction while dropping a level anytime it bumps against one of the many mushrooms scattered across the screen. As you advance through levels by completely eradicating a centipede, the mushrooms grow denser throughout the playing field, causing the centipede to advance downward more rapidly. Meanwhile, the centipede itself grows smaller and smaller as you move into later levels, with more independent heads appearing alongside its main body. Unlike in Space Invaders, Centipede allows you to move in all directions within a small zone of the screen rather than just puttering left and right. The trackball controller gave the arcade game unparalleled precision of control, allowing you to edge forward a few pixels at a time or streak across the screen. All in all, it's a pretty amazing game, and this version, programmed as with so many 7800 launch titles by General Computer Corporation, manages to recreate it about as well as you could possibly hope given the differences between the arcade machine and the 7800. Some compromise is always inevitable in home conversions of Centipede, since the game originally played on a tall vertical monitor. Console ports designed for horizontal screens have to compress the playing field considerably. Few home console versions support trackballs either, since trackball controllers tend to be fairly uncommon, but given the realities of the hardware, this take on Centipede acquits itself well. The 7800's limited color resolution and restricted color palette make for a more muted looking game that lacks the vivid colors of the arcade title, but the mechanics translate faithfully with the centipede, spider, and other creatures behaving as they should. GCC did their best to enhance the game, adding in a few dual player modes to allow for simultaneous play. This works better in the home version than it would have in the arcade game due to the difference in screen proportions. And it's a pretty clever way of making the best of the need to switch to a horizontal layout. Both players have plenty of space to work in without tripping over one another, and the cooperative element adds something new to the formula without changing any of the core mechanics or design. And hey, if you're really determined to make the most of Centipede for 7800, fans have created aftermarket trackball controllers and modded the ROM to support that interface. As we saw with most other 7800 launch titles, Centipede is certainly redolent of an older generation of video games. But as home conversions of this classic went, it offered just about the best possible take on the material.